Pro Row Motorsports is expanding. Austin Hill does not get suspended for intentionally wrecking Cole Custer. Clint Boyer's back to run a truck race. Iowa Speedway and the Roval got track changes. And what about Dale Jr.? Welcome back to Break Hard. My name is Matt. Strap in, because we're going to have to be more energetic than Richard Simmons in his prime to get through all the topics that we have in an orderly time. So off the top, Front Row Motorsports announces that they are expanding to three cars in 2025. They've acquired a third charter. That charter coming from Stuart Haas Racing. They didn't explicitly say that, but we're all smart enough together here to connect the dots. We don't need to draw it out with yarn on a chalkboard like we're searching for Pepe Silvia. So it's coming from Stuart Haas Racing, and there'll be a three-car team, likely to be in the number 36 car who gets that ride well that remains up in the air a little bit at the moment frm will have two open seats available todd gillen's expected to be back with the team so that leaves two seats open and there's basically six stuart haas racing drivers that are currently looking for a seat in 2025 Cole Custer's name has been linked to that number 34 car, and if he does get that, then that leaves a bit of a feeding frenzy for the 36 car over at FRM. That could be Josh Berry, Noah Gragson, Ryan Priest, Riley Herbst, uh, probably not Chase Briscoe, though. He appears to be headed to the Wood Brothers. But for FRM and for NASCAR, this is a positive thing. Jerry Freeze and Bob Jenkins put out their statements on Wednesday afternoon announcing that they have a positive outlook on the future of NASCAR. And uh, we can go ahead and kind of assume that if they're going ahead and buying a charter and announcing that they'll have a third car, that teams are pretty close with NASCAR in this charter negotiation. And hopefully we get an agreement sometime soon. But for the most part, this is good news. Uh, not for the most part. This is great news for the sport. Because the dust hasn't even settled on Stuart Haas Racing, and that company fell quicker than Tower 7 did at this point. And to see another team, a new team, get birthed out of that is good news. And it's good news for Ford, too, because they were looking at a net loss of four. Now it's really only a net loss of three as it stands in terms of the number of cars that they have. They might want to go out and try to find another team. But for FRM, they're reinvesting in the sport. They're now a tier one Ford team. They're likely going to move into the SHR shop. They'll be able to acquire a lot of really good employees from SHR as well if they want them. At the end of the day, this is kind of a win-win for FRM. And unfortunately, it's a lose for Stuart Haas Racing and the people over there, obviously it's a win for Gene and Tony's pocketbooks, but for everybody else, it leaves a bit of uncertainty. So to see them be able to go ahead and land that is, is a good thing. Moving on in the charter talk, who gets the other charters? Well, obviously we know FRM's getting one. It's expected that Trackhouse and 2311 Racing will get another, the other two, that leaves one more that's open uh, to toss up between Legacy Motor Club, RCR, maybe somebody else gets in to, to play here. Doesn't appear that it's going to be Brad Keselowski. He said that we're $30 million short right now uh, when somebody asked him about it on social yesterday, that being on Tuesday. So it looks like RFK is out. And then, of course, we have the topic of Dale Jr., and everybody wants to spend Dale Jr.'s money. Are you kidding me? The internet loves spending Dale Jr.'s money. And they're convinced that the Stuart Haas Racing Charter is being up for sale at the same time that he's acquiring the number eight trademark from DEI means that he's going to buy a charter. He's going to bring Jerem to the Cup Series with the number eight car, the number 88 car. And he's going to plop down 40 to $60 million for charters, plus another four to $5 million in cars, get all the personnel needed and go racing at Daytona come February. That's not happening. Dale Jr. is not involved in any of this. As much as everybody wants to see it happen, it does not appear that it is going to happen. Moving on to another topic, that being Austin Hill. The big boy threw a big boy temper tantrum, like he was Augustus Gloop, like he was the Dudley Dursley of the NASCAR Xfinity Series on Saturday, like he typically does. He doesn't win. He throws a temper tantrum. He's a 30... 30 year old man baby who can't control his emotions and we saw that on perfect display saturday after he banged doors with cole custer he cut his own tire down he wrecked going into turn one and then he takes his frustration out on the double zero of cole custer and intentionally wrecks him down the backstretch under caution into oncoming traffic he gets a 25 point penalty as well as a twenty five thousand dollar fine now remember last week at the all-star race when kyle bush intentionally wrecked ricky sandhouse jr no penalties Austin Hill does it, 25-point penalty, $25,000 fine. When Johnny Sauter does it under caution, one-race suspension. When Kyle Busch does it under caution in the truck series, one-race suspension. When Noah Gragson intentionally wrecked Sage Karam at Road America, had somewhat of a similar fine. So the fine scale continues to be a bit of a slide rule at this point with no real, no real solid answer on what is actually what. Consistently inconsistent, I think, is the top, the term that we always use. 
I don't know what warrants a suspension anymore and what doesn't. Obviously, hooking a guy in the right rear on a mile and a half appears to warrant it. This was a mile and a half. He didn't hook him in the right rear, but he did pick him up and spin him out into oncoming traffic, and thankfully, he didn't get hit. Austin Hill has a track record of not being able to control his emotions, and at some point, he needs to be disciplined for that. He strikes me as a guy that was never disciplined uh, at any point in his life by the looks of it. And he's going to keep doing this. Remember when Carson Hosovar essentially ran the truck series and everybody was too scared to give him a penalty? That's how it feels with Austin Hill right now. So I don't love the penalty. I'm glad he got penalized. Don't love the penalty because I feel like it should probably be more severe. Now, I'm not advocating to suspend people every single week when they have a run-in with somebody else. I'm not saying that. There's a track record, though, with Austin Hill not being able to control his emotions, intentionally wrecking people, doing things like this that is kind of disturbing at this point like how far are we going to let him take it and a 25 point fine twenty five thousand dollar fine is not going to stop him it's just not the guy will continue to race exactly like he does enough about austin hill though moving on to another driver from the former rcr stable that would be clint boyer the fox analyst will be back behind the wheel of a nascar sanctioned event for the first time since the phoenix season finale in 2020 Spire Motorsports announced on Wednesday that Clint Boyer will drive the number seven truck for Spire at Nashville in a few weeks time, which is not that surprising. I mean, in the Xfinity series, Clint Boyer has a 2.5 average finish in his seven starts at Nashville. The guy is really good at Nashville. He also handed Michael Waltrip a win at Nashville one time, so that was very nice of him. He has three NASCAR Truck Series wins in his 14 starts, including 10 top 10. So Clint Boyer is a formidable driver when it comes to the, X the Truck Series and the Xfinity Series, for that matter. It will be interesting to see what he can do, though. And I kind of love the idea of all of these retired guys or, you know, recently retired guys getting back into the trucks, essentially, and kind of seeing where they measure up at. When Greg Biffle did it, it was great. You have, Remember when Eric Darnell just showed up out of nowhere? and just ran a truck series race back in, what was that, 2020? Yeah, give me more stuff like that. I want to see things like that happen. So hopefully Boyer has a good run at it. Um, obviously, the Fox portion of the schedule is done by then, and he can go out there and not have to worry about his TV obligations. So obviously, Boyer's portion of the NASCAR Cup Series schedule will be done. He's not broadcasting anymore, but the race will be on FS1 still. So he'll at least have that tie-in with his parent company, and I'm sure there will be a bunch of a bunch of content around Clint Boyer. We'll have to talk to him on the in-car chat uh, before the race, and then I'm sure he'll have an in-car camera, and we'll have to talk to him post-race and all the things. For Boyer, it's an interesting thing, right? Obviously, he has a good track record at Nashville, too, so we'll go out there and see what he can do. On the racetrack side of things, unfortunate news coming out of Iowa. Obviously, when Iowa got announced, we were all pretty excited about it. It's a quirky 78 mile racetrack, an old surface, a surface that should chew up tires. It's a bumpy surface. It should be pretty entertaining with the next-gen car. Multiple groups. So that's what we were expecting. Well, they had a tire test on Tuesday at Iowa, and it turns out NASCAR has repaved the bottom two lanes at Iowa and basically taken all the characteristics out of the racetrack. Chris Rebell talked about it, and he said essentially it's going to be a bottom feeder race. It's not going to be a multi-lane racetrack, and they kind of took the character out of it. Yeah, that sucks. That makes me go from, like, a John Force level of excited about this race all the way down to, like, a Mike Joy calling the end of the All-Star race level of excited. No longer excited about this on June 16th, Father's Day, USA, 7 p 6 p.m., whatever, 6 p.m., 7 p.m., not my job to promote uh, the race form, but you get the idea. It's, it's unfortunate. I was really excited for Iowa. I wanted to see multiple lanes. I thought the next-gen car would be entertaining there, especially if they brought a soft tire as well. Like, that could have been a fun time. Now, with the bumps taken out, with new pavement on the bottom, like it's Pocono in turn three when they put that one new asphalt uh, strip down, everybody just clamored to that like a moth to a light. Yeah, it sucks. I'm not, so, I'm not stoked about it. I'm sure that there was a reason they did it. Maybe the bumps were too big and they were worried about the next gen car, you know, bottoming out over it and spinning out and crashing, things like that. Maybe there are too many weepers. Maybe the surface was truly in that bad of shape, but it's unfortunate. And it's unfortunate too for IndyCar because again, everything's going to just be a bottom feeder race for the most part. And that bums me out. And other racetrack news, the Roval is getting a slight reconfiguration. Well, in two spots, the front stretch chicane, as well as the infield portion that goes back out onto, you know, oval turn one. So turn six and turn seven used to be a, you know, a uh, right hander into a left hander that then went out into another left hander out onto the racetrack into turn one of the oval. Now, 
Turn six is a much sharper right-hand corner into a hairpin corner at turn seven, like they're trying to go to Long Beach and then out onto the racetrack. They say that they are hoping that this increases passing zones. And honestly, I don't see it because obviously it is a heavy braking zone heading into that hairpin. And unless you're really looking to just kind of set up a demolition derby, that right-hander out of turn six is almost, it's too much to really carry speed to create a braking zone into turn seven. So I don't think it's going to do what they thought. I think the old setup was actually probably better in a sense to set up passing out onto the racetrack back into you know, NASCAR Oval Turn 1. But we'll see. I just don't... I see the vision in a perfect world. I don't think in a realistic world that vision works out. The front stretch chicane gets a lot tighter as well. It is now a very tight right-hand 90-degree corner to go back out onto the front stretch. And again, that is a legitimate corner heading into that. I believe Turn 15 into the chicane right there it's no longer like coming off the banking and then having a straight shot into the chicane. You're not coming off the banking into a corner and then into your braking zone and then a very, very tight right-hander and then back out onto the racetrack. If they're trying to set up a Jimmy Johnson, Martin Truex Jr.-esque type of finish, they may have accomplished it with this. Again, I'm just not sure that the corner before really allows you to set up into a passing zone, into a heavy braking zone, like they think it's going to, other than a desperation move in the closing laps. So if they want destruction, because that's kind of what the Roval has built its name on, they might get it out of this. Uh, but for the most part, I'm not convinced that this is actually as good as it you know, could be or was. And then, of course, we have the people that are like, if they're going to make changes like this, they should run the boot at Watkins Glen. No. Definitely do not do that. So we covered a lot of topics today. We covered FRM, Clint Boyer's return, Austin Hill's penalty, where the SHR charters are going, Dale Jr. Not involved in anything, even though people want to continue to spend his money. Iowa repave, partial repave, as well as the Roval reconfiguration at points. Let me know in the comments whatever you want to talk about at this point. We covered a lot. Like, subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.